Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hi friends, uh, today we will start with uh, another lecture on processing maps. Uh, already in the previous lecture we have seen about deformation mechanism maps and I told you that uh, this idea of making map okay, for different uh, uh, processes, deformation processes was started with uh, creep uh, deformation okay, and it was proposed by HB and then it was uh, extended by Raj. So, you have HB maps and Raj maps. Okay. Now, we have also seen that there are few drawbacks of uh, these maps that uh, you uh, these maps are based on atomic uh, processes okay. and uh, you need to have intimate knowledge about these processes and you have to do lot of microstructural analysis to uh, kind of uh, uh, understand the deformation taking place at different uh, different uh, uh, fields or region, okay, uh, different range of uh, stress and temperature. Uh, to uh, take care of these issues, okay, there was another uh, model proposed, which is called dynamic materials model, okay, and uh, which actually started this processing map uh, uh, kind of. Uh, making a map for doing hot processing. Okay. So, instead of calling it as deformation mechanism map, we are now calling it as processing map okay. and the dynamic materials model which is also called as DMM. Uh, in that the model uh, was proposed that these kind of maps can be constructed to uh, identify the processing region. Okay. So, how they are doing it that uh, the processing is modeled as a system. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, we are taking uh, uh, an example of forging here. Okay. So, already we know how the forging process takes place. You have a, a kind of hammer okay, or movable ramp and your workpiece is there and you are kind of uh, having a compressive deformation. So, uh, what is moving the ramp? We, the move the movement is given by there must be some source a power source okay which is moving the ram and that is what is the hydraulic system in this case so hydraulic peg is the one who is supplying the uh, source or we, which is the source of power okay and then this power is stored in the the whole tooling okay the movement of of the ram and so on okay and uh, then when you are uh, giving input of this power to the material, the material is, a, a, is acting as a dissipator of power. Okay. So, power is supplied by hydraulic, it is stored in the tooling arrangement and then those tooling, the press and so on has given that or uh, have uh, put as an input of this power into the workpiece. Okay. So, workpiece is now acting as a dissipator of that power. So, now already we have seen constitutive equation. So, constitutive equation means how the material or workpiece is going to behave okay. uh, that uh, kind of decide that how this energy will be dissipated uh, at any instant okay. and it will be dissipated in two forms. Okay. So, whatever power we are putting in it will be dissipated in two ways. Okay. One is the change in the microstructure. Okay, which is a irreversible process. Okay, there will be, a, as we have already seen, dynamic recrystallization, dynamic recovery, okay, uh, and all those microstructural processes can take place. So deformation and dislocations will be generated, and okay, so all these microstructural changes will take place. Okay, so some part of the energy which you are putting in will go into the uh, to, to change the microstructure of the material. Okay. And some 
and in fact most of the part not some a uh, good amount of uh, uh, this uh, dissipation will be through thermal processes that means generation of heat ok. So, already we have discussed that that whenever we work on a material ok, whenever you are deforming a material if you touch the material after the deformation there will be some temperature rise in the material and that is due to the dissipation of uh, whatever energy or power you are putting in in form of heat ok. So, this uh, kind of uh, created the argument for generation of processing map ok. So, what dynamic materials model propose that uh, it treats this now uh, system macroscopically. So, earlier deformation mechanism map we are going into the actual atomic processes and from there we were trying to delineate different regions for different processes. But now DMM treats this macroscopically and atomic processes are not taken into consideration and uh, so material is treated as a continuum ok. So, we are not worried about what is going inside ok, we are only looking at the variable or the input we give to the material in form of strain, strain rate, temperature, response of the material in form of stress ok and using these, uh, uh, these uh, values we are trying to find out that how we can construct a map ok. So, stress, strain, strain rate, temperature are variable and strain rate sensitivity is one of the material property already we discussed uh, are used to construct the model ok. So, we are using now continuum principle not worried about what atomic uh, processes are taking place ok. And, uh, uh, coming with a macroscopic uh, model ok. Now, for a for a processing map uh, what should be the requirements ok. So, the processing map or the model which is uh, which we are proposing should be should have some criteria ok which which tells us or which identifies safe processing conditions ok. So, my model for example, in this case now DMM the criteria for DMM model should be such that that um, uh, it should be able to identify the uh, safe processing uh, regions ok like dynamic recrystallization, dynamic recovery and so on. And uh, how I can avoid the processing condition which give rise to defects like void formation, wedge cracking, adiabatic shear bands ok. So, all these defect flow localization ok. So, this this is the requirement of a model or a processing map that it should be able to identify these two important considerations for me safe processing condition and unsafe process processing conditions ok. So, now what is what is dynamic dynamic material model as already we have discussed that workpiece or the material is considered as a dissipator of power. Okay. Of course, uh, we are not considering it as a linear dissipator of power, it is a non-linear dissipator of power ok. So, if total power if we want to see if we want to see in terms of strain rate and stress here now ok. So, the total power is simply is stress multiplied by strain rate ok. So, total strain rate multiplied by total stress this whole area is the total power ok. So, this particular area ok kind of a rectangle ok. So, this is a rectangle uh, that, that is the total power I am uh, putting in the uh, system ok. And this total power ok the model suggests that it con con consists of two parameters ok. It is called G content and J co content ok. And what uh, it is uh, what it, this means is that power is composed of this G content and J co content ok. And in terms of stress and strain rate power can be defined like this ok. And in, in some new parameter which is suggested by DM the power can be defined as composed of two factors G content and J co content ok. Now, what are this G and J co content? G is called dissipator content which dissipate energy by heat flow. Okay, so, as we have already discussed that when you are 
putting uh, power in ok. So, the, the workpiece uh, act as a dissipator of power and dissipation is through two means one is microstructural change and another one is uh, heat ok. So, the G uh, takes care of the heat flow ok or heat generation and J is related to dissipation by microstructural changes ok. So, J is the one which takes care of the microstructural changes ok. And uh, as we have already seen that stress varies uh, by some exponential function ok. Already if you remember uh, stress is always expressed as epsilon dot to the power m ok. That means, it is a non-linear function the stress is a non-linear function of a strain rate. So, strain rate is on x axis and stress is on y axis ok. So, you can see that this deformation behavior of material ok the stress is a non-linear function of a strain rate that is why we are considering it as a non-linear dissipator of power ok. So, it, it is a typical curve which you can get whenever you are looking at stress and strain rate. And of course, as you can see in this particular case the DMM mo model consider power law relationship between stress and strain rate ok. So, the, it, for it, it assumes a power law relationship between stress and strain rate ok. So, which may not be true in some other processing condition, but the processing condition which they were looking at uh, they consider it as a power law uh, relationship ok. And that is why you can see a, a curve like this ok and non-linear uh, variation of stress as a function of a strain rate ok. So, now this total power is divided into two areas now because of this non-linear curve ok. The G content is the, the lower part ok and J co-content is this upper part ok. So, above the curve is the J co-content and below the curve is G content. Okay. So, this is my re, uh, any real system will behave like this ok. Whereas, if you I take a ideal system ok, where now if my a, this is of course, m must be lower than 1. So, in this case m is lower than 1. If m is equal to 1 ok, then it will be a linear relationship obviously. So, sigma will be epsilon dot directly related to epsilon dot ok and there is no constant. So, it will start from 0 and it will be just a straight line ok. That means, it is dividing this rectangle now into two parts equal parts ok. So, J and G are equally divided. So, equal amount of uh, uh, power is going into microstructural changes and equal amount of uh, power is going into as a heat uh, uh, generation ok. And this is the maximum you can reach ok. You cannot go beyond m equal to 1 ok. That is the maximum I can reach a strain rate sensitivity of 1 ok. So, this is the maximum you can achieve. So, this is my maximum energy I can put in for microstructural change which is the half of this rectangle ok. So, half of sigma epsilon dot. And now, I can very nicely define uh, that uh, how much energy is going for microstructural change in a real system. So, this is for an ideal system maximum I can get ok half of the rectangle and what is the actual now energy in any real system is going. So, if I have this kind of understanding I should be able to say that whether my uh, system is uh, uh, working at good efficiency or not in terms of microstructural change that is what is the idea of DMM model ok. So, basically uh, they have defined the efficiency of microstructural change ok by efficiency of power dissipation uh, which is a uh, factor we call as eta ok. So, what it says that ratio of power dissipated in microstructural change J co-content divided by maximum possible efficiency which is J max which is half sigma epsilon dot as I just told you. So, if you do a little bit mathematics here ok. So, J which is coming from a real system and J max which is coming from an ideal system ok. So, of course, if I take this ratio I should be able to say with what is the efficiency of my 
material okay, under the certain processing condition to dissipate energy for microstructural change. So, uh, I should have more efficiency of that means, eta should be more. So, that I should have more energy going for microstructural change okay. uh, because uh, all this high efficiency region are the region where actually all this uh, good microstructural changes take place for example, dynamic recrystallization, dynamic recovery and so on. Okay. So, all this uh, uh, desirable microstructural changes takes place where you have higher efficiency. Okay. So, that is what we are looking for here and it is simply dependent on the strain rate sensitivity. So, only one material parameter strain rate sensitivity of the material. Okay. So, if strain rate sensitivity is going to be high then obviously, I will have higher efficiency. Okay. So, this is how now you, you can use uh, the, the, the data of stress as a function of strain rate at different temperatures okay, to construct a, a, a contour map. Okay. So, a three dimensional contour map is shown here. So, you have log strain rate on this axis, temperature on this axis and efficiency on the z axis and there is a uh, some. Uh, some uh, two dimensional uh, sorry three dimensional feature is there okay and envelope is there okay if i take a section out of it okay at any particular efficiency i should see something like this okay so you have these kind of contours okay which is coming from your this three dimensional envelope okay and now it is a two dimensional uh, envelope okay and which is giving you the the uh, efficiency at different places. Okay. So, 41 is means 41 percent efficiency that means 0 0.41 eta okay. or in terms of percentage you can say 41 percent and then the 34, 38 percent, 34 percent and so on. Okay. So, these are the what we call as efficiency map. Okay. So, high efficiency is desirable because I told you DRV, DRX, DRV, superplasticity are all high efficiency processes. Okay. However, occurrence of some defects like cracking, void formation also have dissipation, high dissipation efficiency. So, this is another interesting thing that some defects also gives you very high efficiency uh, for power dissipation because lot of power goes in creation of creation and propagation of these defects. Okay. So, when so not all energy will go in microstructural change some energy may also go in the in creation of these, these defects and which are also high efficiency. Okay. So, just simply looking at a efficiency map and saying that okay, this is my high efficiency that means, the all the good processes may be taking place may not be true uh, sometimes because other defects which are produced in the material also have high efficiency. So, it may be possible that the, that the defects are occurring at high efficiency region. Okay. So, we have to also have another criteria, criterion which is required to identify inst instability during deformation. Okay. So, one is high efficiency, I want to know that what is the uh, high efficiency regions okay. and you can understand that I am doing that just by knowing the stress as a function of strain rate, strain and temperature. Okay. So, you have temperature on x axis here and strain rate on y axis. Okay. Of course, it is a, a taken as logarithmic because we are changing a strain rate by order of magnitudes okay. 10 to the power minus 3, 10 to the power minus 2 then 10 to power minus 1 and so on. Okay. So, I have to have a log scale temperature I am more or less uh, varying in linear fashion. So, x axis is linear here and on that we are plotting this high uh, efficiency maps. Okay. Uh, now, as I told you because of the defects uh, some defects are also having higher efficiency. Okay. I have to have another criterion which can tell me that where the in instability is taking place. Okay. And that is again this DMM model suggests that uh, what should be the instability criterion. Okay. 
and that is also again dependent on the strain rate sensitivity. Okay. So, strain rate sensitivity is there. Uh, so, uh, you just have to take uh, uh, logarithmic and the, the slope of that uh, between m m and m plus 1 as a function of epsilon dot will and this, this particular value should be less if it is less than 0 then uh, there is an instability. Okay. So, this is an instability criterion. Okay. If it is more than 0 then I am in the stable region. Okay. So, sometime in books you will see the equation is written as greater than 0, do not get confused. Greater than 0 means they are trying to tell you that which are the stable uh, processing conditions or proce stable regions in, in processing map and if it is less than 0 means they are trying to tell you which are the regions where the instability can occur. Okay. So, instability conditions are like adiabatic shear bands, flow localization, dynamic strain edging, king bands and etcetera. So, lot, lot, lot of uh, defects are there which can occur during the hot deformation process. Okay. So, this particular criteria can be used to identify the, uh, the instable region. For example, here it is shown in this figure here, uh, there are some contours. Uh, are shown a b c d up to h okay and uh, if you see the value the zeta value okay uh, i have not included that here actually this is should be zeta okay so zeta values if you see uh, these are all negative okay 0 0.88 0 0.7 0 0.63 and so on okay h is 0 basically g is minus 0.13 so, this is my g contour, okay. so, this is minus 0 0.13. Okay. So, basically here we are not uh, uh, concerned too much about the what is the value of zeta. Uh, as, as long as it is less than 0, that is enough for me to uh, uh, identify that this is an instable region. Okay. I do not want to kind of find out with whether it is more in, in unstable or less unstable. Okay. If it is less than 0, that is sufficient for me. So, I will not be plotting uh, these contours for instability when I am going to put it on a processing map. Okay. So, now you can see here two things are combined. Okay. So, you have efficiency contours okay, 38, 34 percent and so on. And on top of that, there is a this shaded region okay, which is taken from this final contour h here okay, where the instability parameter zeta has value of 0 okay, and below within that everything is now negative. Okay. So, they have identified this particular region as the instable region. Okay. So, if, if efficiency is high also, if, if it, may, it may be possible that you have a high efficiency contour here, but we should not do any processing in this shaded region because that high efficiency may be, may be occurring because of the presence of some defects or presence of some instability in the material. Okay. So, uh, actually you should already we have seen when we were developing constitutive equation that how you can get these parameters. Okay. So, I, I, I hope you will be able to do these kind of calculations uh, without any problem. For example, m if I want to know, okay, suppose this is epsilon dot, this is sigma and you have some okay, variation like this. Okay as we have just seen. So, if I want to calculate now strain rate sensitivity m, okay, we know that it is dependent on this. Okay. So, one way is to take, uh, if, if the m is constant, one way is to take the ln of this thing and find out the slope of the straight line, which I have already told you. But suppose if the m does not remain constant during the deformation or at, for at different strain rates. Okay. Then what you can do is you can fit a polynomial equation to this curve here okay, and then you differentiate it. Okay. So, that will be able to give you the 
uh, the m at different locations. So, wherever you want you can put epsilon dot of that value. Okay. So, at different epsilon dot you will be able to get the slope okay, if the slope is changing. And suppose uh, at some point uh, maybe it will become straight then that is where you have power law breakdown. Okay. There is no power law dependence of stress on strain rate. Okay. So, it may be possible only in a certain strain rate window that your uh, stress is dependent on strain rate. Okay, with a, with a exponent of m. Okay, similarly, I I think you should be able to calculate this zeta also, because only m is there and epsilon dot is there. Okay, so you have to take ln of this and then differentiate it. Okay, and if the value is less than zero, you know that it these are instable regions. Okay, so basically, processing map is the one. Okay where the efficiency map and instability maps are superimposed on each other. Okay. So, that a combined give you some uh, processing condition and that is why these are called processing maps. Okay. So, idea here is that you have to identify where you have higher uh, efficiency. For example, you have higher efficiency at this point, then you have higher efficiency somewhere here. Okay and you have instability here. Okay. So, now the remaining areas are safe areas I can do processing there, okay. but I would like to do processing where the efficiency is high. Okay. Generally, we would like to avoid high temperature region because there you will have uh, if, if any recrystallization is taking place then subsequent grain growth will also be a possibility. Okay. Of course, uh, in any industrial processes if you want to increase the temperature you also have to consider the cost of uh, uh, cost of heating or uh, cost of raising the temperature to a high temperature okay, the electrical cost. Okay. So, you can always have a kind of a, uh, uh, a give and take here. Okay. So, maybe you can choose uh, maybe lower uh, efficiency region okay. it is here it is 48 percent, but here is only 33 percent, okay. but the temperatures are lower okay. and uh, of course, the strain rate are slightly higher. Okay. So, that is also good that you can do the processing at a higher strain rate. So, it will take much less time. Okay. So, the productivity will be more. Okay. So, all these things has to be considered by, by a, uh, a, a, an engineer. Okay, who is designing the process. Okay. Of course, you have to avoid the instable region. Now, how to interpret and validate whatever you are developing? Okay. Still now, we have not talked about microstructure at all. Okay. We have just used the, the, the material response in terms of flow stress as a function of strain, strain rate, temperature and use that to develop this processing map. We have not talked anything about the uh, microstructure right now. Okay. We, we have said that the high efficiency regions are the one where you will have uh, dynamic recrystallization, dynamic recovery and maybe some defect formation and the instable regions are where you have uh, shear uh, adiabatic shear bands or flow localizations. Okay. So, but we have not uh, we have not come to the processing map from the atomistic processes okay we have come it from the continuum uh, mechanics so now but once we develop that i want to know whether what i am trying to say or predict from the processing map is 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 what uh, is also being followed by the material okay so basically is you have to do a microstructural analysis but uh, the advantage here is that you have to do very selected uh, sample you have to see for microstructural analysis. So, wherever you have high efficiency, okay, so 2, 3 samples from there, then maybe couple of sample from instable region to identify okay, in this region some uh, defect is occurring. Okay. So, th that will be able to validate your processing map that it has been uh, generated properly. Okay.
So, as we told, told that dynamic recrystallization is one of the our uh, primary objective to have processing condition in that. Okay. So, in general from different materials okay, uh, when people have done uh, work on this, okay, they are able to identify a few ranges right now that for uh, uh, in terms of processing condition for low staking fault energy materials, okay, the temperature range is around 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 of uh, melting point okay and the strain rate range is around 0.1 to 1 per second for low extracting fault energy this is where you should be able to get a dynamic recrystallization whereas for high staking fault energy material the strain rate range is point lower strain rate range okay uh, as compared to uh, the low staking fault energy materials okay so, of course, the temperature will be more the range will be more or less same. If you want to talk in terms of maximum dissipation dissipation efficiency just to know that what what we should aim for what efficiency we should aim for. So, for low staking fault energy materials 30 to 40 percent efficiency if you are getting you should be in the uh, dynamic recrystallization uh, domain. Okay. And if you have a high staking fault energy material okay, like aluminum and so on, so the efficiency should be in the range of 50 to 55 percent. Okay. So, if you are able to get that kind of efficiency in a particular processing domain, okay, then you, you can be uh, in the dynamic recrystallization uh, region. Okay. So, this is what uh, you should be looking for. Okay. Of course, microstructural science we have already discussed about dynamic recrystallized uh, uh, microstructure that how they look. Okay, few more things you can add there. Okay, that if you have a S cast structure. Okay, S cast structure already I have explained you initially that you have dendrites. Okay, dendrites and so this is primary dendrite and then you have secondary dendrite. Okay, and so on. Okay. So, these are the dendrites which have lower solute content okay. and in between the two dendrites there will be interdendritic region where the solute will content will be high. Okay. So, if this type of microstructure is changing it to a rot structure okay, then it is a good sign that you, your micro your processing condition is able to generate this kind of rot structure. If acicular structure okay, means which acicular means which contains uh, kind of a, this kind of blade like if it contains these kind of features okay, and that if that is changing into spherodized or globularized microstructure okay, then again you are in, in the good processing window. Okay. And prior particle boundary in powder metallurgy alloy um, material should be eliminated. So, you should not be able to see the, that what, what were the particle boundaries in the powder metallurgy material. Okay. So, if you are able to uh, see all these features you are in the dynamic recrystallization region. Instability regions, wedge cracking okay, already we have seen that in the Raj map that what do we mean by wedge cracking. Temperature range is of course high here, the strain rate range is low, okay. so it is basically very high temperature and very low strain rate where you have super plastic kind of deformation usually there you can see this kind of wedge cracking. Ductile fracture of course will occur at even lower temperature and higher strain rates, okay. so usually that should not be our concern in hot deformation. Adiabatic shear bends you will observe at 45 degree to the compression axis okay, usually. Flow localization are usually less severe than adiabatic shear bends and this occur at around 35 degree to the compression axis okay. and there are king bends. So, if you know the paralytic structure where you have alternate bends of uh, ferrite and cementite. Okay. And when you deform this kind of structure, th th there, there are kinks which develop in the in the, the in this uh, lamellar structure. Okay, so it becomes something like this. So there will be a kink like this. Okay, it, it has kinked. 
So, this is another kind of defect because later on you can have a crack initiation at these points. Okay. So, these type of different instability uh, condition can arise and these are the microstructural features for that. Okay. For example, few uh, images are given here. This, this is a image for adiabatic shear bands. Uh, these are very narrow typically 5 to 500 micron and they consist of very highly sheared material. Okay. So, these happen as the name suggests because of the adiabatic heating. Okay. So, you we know that when you are deforming at very high strain rate, you can also see the strain rate is mentioned here, okay, 1000 per second, 3000 per second. Okay. So, you are not giving enough time for heat to dissipate. Okay, so, the locally temperature will rise okay, and the material will become very soft okay. and when you are deforming progressively the deformation will be in, uh, will be concentrated in that narrow region. Okay. So, and you can see that these are very long. So, they will actually usually uh, cover uh, large number of grains. Okay. For example, here it is 600 micron is the scale and uh, it is almost covering the whole figure. Okay. So, it must be uh, around 1000 to 1500 micron shear bend. Okay. So, it should uh, at least uh, cover uh, maybe 50 grains or so. Okay. Of course, depending upon the grain size. Okay. Similarly, you can see here a very big shear bend is there. Okay. Here also you can see a shear bend formation with the crack formation also. Okay. It looks like that there is a crack here okay, and the shear bend is somewhere here. Okay. So, if you see go in the, in the shear bend you will see that very fine microstructure where highly sh highly deformed material will be there okay, because the, the deformation is localized there because of adiabatic heating. That is why these are called adiabatic shear bands. Okay, so, so, this is a one kind of microstructural feature I wanted to show you when we are talking about defects. Okay. So, after deformation mechanism map, we have seen uh, processing map okay, and the model which is used which is called dynamic materials model to develop this processing map, we have discussed that and uh, it contains two important maps. One is efficiency map and another in, is instability map. Okay, and combine that you should be able to identify the processing condition for your material. Okay. So, in the next lecture we will see th these, uh, these aspects of processing map okay, in more detail to understand that how we can see a processing map with more uh, details. Okay. Thank you.